Amen. Matthew chapter 25, uh, starting in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling in a far country. Now, he, he's, he's, he's making the comparison there that the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are interchangeable, and uh, it, it, it covers the spectrum of the spirit realm. It covers the spectrum of the universal realm, where it's the realm that, that created angels live with spirit men. Remember Isaiah, or I, I think it was Isaiah, somebody can correct me, when him and his servant were surrounded and he said, Lord, open up the eyes. Well, he opened up his eyes into that spiritual realm where the heavenly hosts were, Elijah. He said, don't be afraid. What did he say? There's more with us as with them. And this place is, you know, you see all these empty chairs? Well, the angels are taking a break and they want to hear what you hear. They want to somehow experience what you experience, but they can't. They can't because you are in a class by yourself. Amen? And so the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling in a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And in one he gave five talents to another two and to another one to each according to his own ability and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two, two gained two more also. I'm having a hard time with those lights. <laughs> but likewise, he who had received, let's see, but I'm sorry, verse 15, 18. <laughs> But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. And a long time, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to the five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides him. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And he also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, turn the page. Lord, I del you delivered to me two talents and have gained two more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not watered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and, and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you know that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited the money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from whom who... But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That was the scary part to me whenever I read it. <laughs> the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Praise God. <laughs> but the kingdom of God that he's talking about is a spiritual place. He also told us in one place, he said that the kingdom of God, he said, don't look over to the left, don't look over to the right, don't look over yonder, don't look here. He said, look inside. That's where the kingdom of God abides. And sometimes we, we're, we're, we're like the, the Jewish people. We're, we're looking for the kingdom to be established when he's already established it in us, in our everyday lives. Amen? And so some of the things I want to point out about this story that I saw 
And I think they're important truths about kingdom living. And one of the first things I noticed in this story is that we are not all created equal. As, as believers, we are not created equal. I heard somebody say one time, I can do anything else that anyone else can do. It's not true. Amen. It's not true. Just get in a group of 10 people and see if you can all duplicate each other. It will not happen. And so we see that some were, were given five graces, some two, some one. And one of the greatest things that we need to be careful about in the body of Christ is trying to compare ourselves one to another. Amen? Amen. You know, I think, about, uh, I think about a joke I heard. I always got to tell a joke. <laughs> about the man who said, it's not fair. God asked me if I wanted looks, and I thought he said books. I said, no thanks, I have no use for them. Got left out. <laughs> and we, we, see, we see people, you know, some people are, are born into greatness. Other people find greatness in themselves and become great. You know, John D. Rockefeller, I heard a preacher say one time I started thinking about, and maybe some of you folks don't even know who he is, some of the younger ones. But uh, in comparison, he was the richest man that ever lived in, in comparison to his dollars he had then to what they'd be now. And this preacher said, I started thinking about, boy, if I, if I just had John D. Rockefeller's money, what would I do? What would I do? And he said he began to think about it and think about it. And he said, of course, I could do nothing. But he found out a truth about John D. Rockefeller that when he was a young man, he determined, when he was making $4 a day, he determined to tithe unto God. And he, he lived that type of lifestyle, a lifestyle of giving until the end of his life, he became one of the, the greatest givers there ever was. Foundation was founded. And he put his money in. Some of the millionaires or billionaires today are trying to do the same thing with their money. And so we just, uh, you know, we, we, we cannot compare ourselves one to another. In every person, God has invested some ability. Amen? I mean, you need to know that. You need to know that God thought enough about you that he thought it worthwhile to invest in you, to put something special in you that makes you different from every other person that you know. I, I, my wife has watched me sit in my recliner watching preachers, and I do watch some TV preachers because I think some of them are very good. And one of my favorites is T.D. Jakes. I love T.D. Jakes. I'm mesmerized by him when he talks. He is the most articulate man preacher anyway that I've ever listened to. And I sit there and go, she's heard me say it, oh, I wish I could talk like T.D. Jakes. <laughs> you know, you don't get anything by wishing, amen? If I saw the bottom line, he's probably spent hours upon hours, thousands of hours learning the English language, studying, reading dictionaries. I don't get past two pages to second. I've heard somebody one time say, you need to read the dictionary. Well, after page two, it, it's not, it, that ain't going to cut it for me. You know, then I, I got one of these e-book things and the word of the day, you know. And so I've been trying the word of the day to see if that'll take me somewhere. And most of them I'll look at and thank God they have this thing you push and guess what it does? It pronounces it for you. <laughs> uh, it still doesn't help. <laughs> or I watch... Uh, I watch um, um, Rod Parsley. And, you know, it might be too strong for some people with a little organ music behind it. But that man could preach. <laughs> he got to preach on him when he gets up there. Well, that's not me. <laughs> I watch our own pastor and I'm amazed at, at his ability to bring the word of God forth and to stand strong and be bold in proclaiming that word. And he doesn't just do that in front of us as a congregation. If you have any personal time, you better be ready. Because he will answer you with a word and be bold. And maybe you were looking for a little sympathy. 
<laughs> Somebody showed her the crown. <laughs> that ain't going to work either. <laughs> uh, he'll, he'll rebuke you real quick with the Word of God. And me, I just, you know, I'm kind of a, oh, come here, let me hug you. Uh, uh, oh, let's cry together. You know, I'm that kind of guy. <laughs> but it takes all kinds. And so, so what do I do? I thank God for who I am. Amen. I thank God that, that he can put something in a person that makes them genuine and makes them uh, true and, and, and gushy maybe. <laughs> My wife has to slap me all the time and say, quit crying. <laughs> but there is waiting for you only a poem, this poem has, says this, there is waiting a work only your hands can avail. And so if you falter, a chord in the music will fail. God is orchestrating this great body of believers, universally, locally, and his orchestration is wanting everyone to have his part. High school band. I, I remember the kid that had the triangle. You know? And I thought, ugh. Wow, you know, what do you do with that? <laughs> you know, call people to dinner or... And you know, and, and they wait in anticipation. They have the triangle. They wait in anticipation. Two-thirds the way through the song. Well, maybe you're that triangle tonight. Maybe you're not the, the first violin or the, or the first horn. And you're sitting there with your triangle in the body of Christ, thinking, ooh, what do I do with this? You use it. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Ooh. And so, uh, in, the, in the parable... You know, the talent was, was money. The, the, the Lord left them with money. And in the English language, we've just translated that into talent and abilities. And usually when this, this uh, parable is preached, it's usually about your talent. Not so much your money. Now, God cares about your money. You understand that. He's very concerned about how you treat your money. And how you use your money. But... The point I want to get across to you tonight is, is how, do, how are you using your talent? And don't, don't freak out. We're not asking you to use it in the church. It's great when your talents can be productive in the church. But God wants you to have an abundant life. He said, I've come that you have an abundant life. And it's more important that you use your gifts in your life. Amen? Amen. We can generate gifts for the church, and, and, and sometimes people are in the wrong place. But when you're dealing with your own life, that's where your gift needs to be made known. Be true to yourself. And the gifts will flow over into the church, but I want you to see yourself for who you are today. Amen? Hallelujah. One of the things that... Uh, I noticed about the, the two men who used their talents. When they came, when our Lord came, he made this statement. He said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. You know, we talk about the end of life. You know, oh boy, that's what I want to hear when I get before Jesus. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I noticed something there. He didn't say, well done, thou good and successful. Successful. He said, faithful. You provide the faithfulness. You say, here I am, Lord. You provide the faithfulness. And he's the one that provides the success. Don't try to make success out of your own uh, your own efforts. You know, find what that talent is God has for you. Amen? And, um, whoa, I, did I do something? <laughs> and so faithfulness is ours to give and success is God's to give. And so the well done, 
the well done means you tried. No man is ever condemned by God for trying. The condemnation comes when you don't try. Condemnation comes because you can't step out. And there was a reason uh, that uh, the man didn't step out. And, and I saw a couple of things. One was that he was afraid. He said, I knew you to be a hard master, and I was afraid. And I, I just want to share from my heart right now, you know, the image that we have of God is so paramount in how well we overcome things in this life. I believe, number one, this, this man did not know God. He did not know his master. He did not know what kind of person his master was. He said, I, I saw you as a hard master, a taskmaster. And people that have that kind of viewpoint of God, they tremble at his presence instead of rejoice in his presence. Because he's not a hard man. He's not a taskmaster. He, he is full of mercy. I used to, if I said this one time, I said it 10,000 times in my Christian walk. The Lord is good and his mercies endure, how long? Anybody know? Forever. That's how good he is. His mercy will never end. His mercy is, is pouring out every day. Every day I bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Because I don't forget his benefits. I don't forget that he's forgiven me from a life of, of, con, a, a life of destruction, a life that was going to lead me into outer darkness. I don't forget that he said he'll heal my body. That he'll crown me with love and kindness. Love and kindness. So, so this, even though this man was a servant, he had the wrong image of God. He saw God in a, in a bad way. The thing we hear about here is God is good. How long? Where? All the time. All the time. And uh, I think one of the things that made him uh, uh, fearful was the fact that he was given a, uh, given a, uh, a thing to do and he didn't do it. And because of that, he was fearful. It's, it's like, I, I, you know, uh, uh, Jimmy Swaggart. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that name anymore, but the man knows God. He said when he was a kid, he said he loved to go fishing. He said his daddy gave him a bag of beans one day. And he said, uh, Jimmy, Go out there and plant these beans in the garden. He said, Daddy, I want to go fishing. He says, no, you go plant those beans in the garden and plant them now. Okay, so he run out there to the garden and his fishing pole laying out there on the ground. He said, it just got the best of me. I went fishing. He said, you know what? I forgot all about those beans. He said, they were the furthest thing from my mind until one day my daddy looked out there in the garden and said, you know what? Them beans ought to be coming up by now. <laughs> he said it dawned on him. He'd put them beans inside a hollow hole in a tree. He said, so I got out there and I watered that ground. I got out there and I hold those weeds up. But he says, you know, he said, I knew there wasn't nothing coming up. And he said, I didn't tell my daddy, you know, that, that I didn't plant the beans. He just said, well, it must have been a bad patch of beans. But he said, I lived with it. I lived with knowing that I didn't obey. That I didn't do what he asked me to do. And I think that was one of the struggles this person had was that he knew he hadn't obeyed his master. In the Amplified in Matthew 25, it says, He who had received one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I know you to be a harsh and hard man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you had not winnowed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you can have what is yours now. No, no, no. He called him a lazy, slothful 
servant. Pretty harsh words. And I tell you what, unless you, unless you put your hand to the plow and you work, you might hear those words too. But he was afraid to work. That was one of the things that kept him back was he was slothful. And he just entrusted one talent. And, and what did he do? He buried that talent. And God doesn't want you to bury your talent. He wants you to be ready to be used with your talent. I've watched, I've watched the gifts of God operate in this church from the top to the bottom. From the top to the bottom. I watched, I watched a, a lady visit our church and, and her baby was, was being a little fitful. And I watched one of our lovely people let the gift that was in them flow towards that woman and took that child and helped her so that she might be able to receive I've seen it operate in many of you, in your graces and your gifts. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, I got all, all past my notes. <laughs> uh, praise God. And so, uh, one of the things that great people have in common is hard work. And you, can't, you cannot let your gift lead you into false pride, into deception. You know, many a person, they, they think, if I can't have the top spot, why have any spot at all? Oh, I have such a good voice. I should be up there singing. And so therefore, you, you clam up and you don't sing at all. Or maybe somebody asks you to be an usher in a church, and you say, well, if I can't be the head usher, there's no sense in me, you know, trying. We can't have that kind of pride and that, that kind of deception in our lives. Amen? Amen? There's an unbreakable law in life. You know, before freezers came along, people would just pick the fruit and eat their fruit. And now you can take strawberries and freeze them and, you know, three months later take them out and they still have freshness to them and life to them. But, but the gift that God gives you is not like that. You have to use that gift. It's like a seed you put up on a concrete shelf. If it stays up there, sooner or later, that seed is going to die and it will not bear forth fruit. And what did we see in the story about this man? You know, he hid his talent. What did the master do? He took that talent away from him and gave it to the one that had ten. And so... I remember Sharon's grandmother, she was a great prophetess of God, and, and, uh, and she talked about that shelf being put up on the shelf. And she looked at me one day and she said, many a minister has put their gift on a shelf and it's died. Don't you ever be guilty of putting your gift on a shelf. Let it just go by. Uh, there was a gentleman here in the church a while back, uh, uh, Van Crouch? Was it Van Crouch? And he talked about, uh, about churches and, and how churches pop up, have a little time in the Lord, and then they're gone. And, and a lot of times it's because, number one, the gift of God that's in the church is, is uh, despised, talk, talked about, you can't, you can't do that to the seed that's God's. And, and I'm talking from experience because uh, me and Sharon pioneered a church one time in North Dakota. And we left the ministry and came back to Houston and thought we'd put it in good hands, but it ended up not being in good hands. And a year later, that church that we bled over and started was gone. And oh, how that hurt hurt us at the fact that it happened to it, but oh, how it hurt God. Unless the Lord builds a house, they that labor, labor in vain. And personality will take you so far, but when it gets down to the nitty gritty, you have to have a gift from God. You cannot walk without the gift of God. He said he ascended on high 
and did what? He gave gifts unto men. This master is away. In this story, the master goes away. And he comes back. And there's a, a day that he's coming back. And we all want to hear that. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I love the second part. I love the second part. I think so many of us have missed this. The second part he says, and enter into the joy of the Lord. Woo! I want you to know there's a joy you can walk into, and it's not your joy. It's the same joy that Jesus Christ walked this earth on. Yes. Yes. In Nehemiah, a, be a beautiful story of restoration in Nehemiah, that he was in captivity. And the word came to him that Jerusalem, the walls had been torn down, the gates had been torn down, and that Jerusalem was in ruins. And it saddened his heart that the place that was so powerful that David walked and Solomon walked, that it had fallen into the hands of the enemy, and in spite, they tore the city apart. And he came before his king, the king that he was, that was his master, he was an ungodly king. Nehemiah was a godly man. And he walked before that king one day and the king saw his countenance because he was usually a joyful type of, of guy. And the king saw his countenance and said, what's wrong? The ungodly king said, what's wrong? He said, well, since you asked me, I'm going to tell you. He said, Jerusalem is in ruins and I want to go repair it. I want to go build it back up. And the king looked at him and said, how long is it going to take you? So he laid out his plan before the king, and the king said, that is fine with me. Go and rebuild the walls and put the doors back on the city of Jerusalem. Sent an army with Nehemiah to, to protect him. Wrote letters to all the enemies whose lands he would have to go through as an Israelite. And he got back and... He had a job before him because the people were downtrodden. They thought, oh, there's no way. What do you, you want us to do what? We can't even get past the rubble. It's so bad. We can't even move around in here because the stones are every which way and all the doors are gone. And he said, God wants us to do this. And so they began to rebuild the walls. And it, it was so bad that that they would have a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other to fight off the enemies. And time and time again, I read in those chapters, it enlisted people who were helping to rebuild the walls. And so many times again, all that was required of them was to build the wall that was in front of them. Don't worry about the wall to the left. Don't worry about the, the, the wall to the right. Repair that which is in front of you. And see, God's not asking you to look at way out here or look way out here to do something for Him. He's saying, look right in front of you. What is there right in front of you that you can do? And so time went by, and the next thing they knew, the doors were being placed back on, the walls were being repaired, they were being laughed at by their enemies, saying, oh, what do they think they're doing? And when they got it all through with, Nehemiah looked around, and there wasn't but about three or four hundred of them. He said, this isn't right. And so he called all these people that had helped build, rebuild the walls. He said, get a, get a message out to your family. Tell them to come on in. Tell them to come on back. You know, jump on in. The water's fine. And they began to go out. And at the end of the gathering, there were 45,000 people strong in the, in the city of Jerusalem. And so he decided, okay, let's, let's bring it all back into focus. Let's get the priest of the Lord. And they gathered all the people together, and they began to read the law of Moses. And the people began to shake, and the people began to tremble. And they hadn't heard the Word of God in a long time. I tell you, when you don't have the Word of God in your life, you know, when you begin to hear it again, it begins to bring in the water and the freshness and the anointing that the water can do, the, wor the washing of the water of the Word. 
But they began to tremble and they began to almost get into a state of fear as they heard the words brought forth. And Nehemiah said, this isn't right. This isn't the way we want to go. And so he told them, okay, guys, let's just stop right now. Let's stop in all your quivering and, and fearfulness. Let's turn this thing around. And so he commanded them to go out, number one, uh, go, get, go get you some good food to eat. Go get you some sweet drink to drink. And, and then like, a lot like us, you know, <laughs> things going bad, let's go get some good food and some sweet tea. <laughs> That'll make it right. And those that don't have any, make sure they have some. Said all this to say this. A people of righteousness to the scepter of your kingdom. You have righteousness, you have you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God. Oh boy, I'm reading the wrong scripture here. <laughs> But it's a good one, too. <laughs> oh, where's Nehemiah? <laughs> I didn't think that sounded right. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priests and scribes and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those who, whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our God. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, and, and we use that a lot of times. We, oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Not ever thinking that God is talking about his joy in us. It said he was anointed above all his brethren. Amen? Praise God. And so, this isn't a grievous message, but he wants you to receive your reward, and that's walking in that joy. He said, my joy, I leave with you. Amen. He was, it says he was a man acquainted with sorrows. But he woke up every day. I believe I can, I'll never forget the, the time I saw the picture of Jesus laughing. I don't know where it came from. I don't know where I saw it. But it hit me. Jesus was joyous. He woke up every day with joy on his heart, looking for what? was going to be his path for that day. He never woke up and said, whoa, I don't think I want to go that way. Because he had a fountain within him. Amen. And praise God, that fountain is now yours. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so I, I might have got ahead of myself a little bit, but you'll all forgive me. I want to read a story to you. And I want you to begin to be responsible for the talent that God has given you. That, that piece of wall right before you. And you'll find as you begin to walk in that, as you begin to trust in God to help you in those areas, that you're going to see things differently. You're going to see that you're not responsible for the whole world. That you're not responsible for the weight of the world. <laughs> Jesus already took that on, amen? <laughs> he took it on and, and passed to us. Joy unspeakable. Joy full of glory. Amen? Well, I read this story, and I just want to finish with it. It's called How to Sleep Well on a Windy Night. I, one of the reasons this story meant so much to me, because my mother, my mother was struck by lightning twice in her life. And she was also in a tornado. Lived in Mississippi, out in the country. And she raised us with a fear, a, a, a ferocious fear of storms. And it took me many years into my adulthood 
to, to let God deal with this. And my wife can testify when we'd have a storm come through, let's get up. Let's get, I'm not going to get blown away. My mother, I still hear my mother, we're not going to get blown away in our underwear. <laughs> and so, boy, it'd start thundering or the wind start blowing or the sky would turn yellow. It could be 2 o'clock in the morning, but she'd have us kids up and have us get dressed. <laughs> oh, come on now. <laughs> Nobody else like that? <laughs> And so that carried over into my adult life. You know, just... Yeah, she, I ain't good. You can do what you want to. <laughs> and so listen to this story. It's, it's cute, but it has a good ending to it. And that's where I would like to see you. You have the peace of God and the joy of God. A boy went to a farmer and asked to be given a job as a hired hand. <coughs> the farmer asked, are you willing to work? Please, sir. Yes, sir. I can sleep well on a windy night, was his reply. Farmer kind of looked at him and said, uh, can I trust you to look after my things? Again, he replied, yes, sir. Please, sir. I can sleep well on a windy night. The farmer asked several questions seeking to determine if the boy was honest and trustworthy, but to each question he got only the one answer. He decided the boy might be a little foolish, but there was something about him the farmer liked, so he hired him. The, bo the boy proved to be a willing worker and everything went well till one night a big storm came in. The farmer heard, heard the storm and rushed up to the boy's room. Get up, he shouted. Let's go down. We have to tie down the haystacks and put, on, put up our tools and secure the barn doors. But the boy was so sound asleep, the farmer could not wake him. Fearing to waste time trying to get him up, he rushed down to see about the things himself. When he came to the haystacks, he found them securely tied down. He found the tools in their proper place in the barn and the doors closed securely. As he went back into the house, he realized what the boy had meant about sleeping well on a windy night. He meant that each day he did his job best he could and even, the, even in the midst of the storm, he could sleep. Seems like to me Jesus had that problem one time in a boat. They were fearing for their lives, but where was Jesus? He was asleep in the bottom of the boat. And the Bible even says his, pillow, his head was on a pillow. <laughs> well, you know, we can all be like Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. So discover your gift. Don't compare your gift to any others. Use your gift and enter into the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. If you're in Houston and looking for a good home church, Pastors Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we are certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. For more information about God, salvation through Jesus Christ, or this ministry, please visit us on the web or download our Houston Faith phone app.